You know, one of the things that uh, hardened faculty will sometimes do is uh, they will run from uh, uh, wanting to teach general education courses. And the difficulty of teaching a general education course is, is to uh, bring, bring a level of excitement to a topic where probably nine out of 10 students in the class are just doing it because they have to, or they'd rather not, you know, that kind of thing. One of the reasons that I continue to like general education courses, particularly I teach an intro to philosophy course on Tuesday nights here, is, is, is it gives students categories of thought that they didn't have. I give them a vision at the beginning of the course and they are scared spitless. I mean, they can handle survey of American government somewhat because they're, most of them they're, are they're Americans and they have some uh, understanding of the American system of government. But philosophy, they just, they're just thinking I, we're gonna smoke pipes and, and <laughs> green, green great thoughts and so they're just scared to death. And so I give them a vision very early on in the class of how this class will help them. It will give them categories of thought and, and filters of thought to where they hear things that they'll be able to, to uh, more skillfully listen and more skillfully speak. And, and that's, that's in, in large part why I, why I continue to like teaching uh, the general education courses is it gives, it gives me an opportunity to uh, influence people in that way. So I'm not sure if the next hour is going to be just completely novel to you, uh, probably not, or whether it's going to be uh, just completely old hat. Uh, this by way uh, of being a somewhat of a refresher course. Uh, in order to understand American politics, you have to understand a little bit of our history. And so I'd like to walk through a little bit of that with you, uh, give you some semblance of, uh, if I can find my clicker, to give you some semblance of, uh, uh, where we find ourselves today is largely a function of where we found ourselves 200 and some odd years ago. Uh, the Constitution can't be understood today without understanding why it was a corrective to our first system of government. And that's kind of where I'd like to start today. So let's see if my uh, clicker will work here. All right. Here's what we'll try to do. Now, I'm a PowerPoint kind of guy. I, 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 I do it for two reasons. One is I realize that looking at me for a couple hours is a, is, a, is a daunting task, and so this gives you something else to look at. The other thing is, is that uh, I've been a student long enough to know that you kind of need to know where things are going so that you can kind of keep tracking, and I, and I put PowerPoint slides together in that regard for you. So they're not meant to be exhaustive or anything like that. They're just to help you keep your train of thought here and, and uh, help you keep tracking with me. So the first thing I'd like to do is help you to understand the, the, the nature of our constitutional order. And again, in order to gain a better understanding of, of what our constitutional order is supposed to be, it's helpful to know that this wasn't our first one. I mean, you can go to Philadelphia today and go to Independence Hall and, s and literally stand in the same little cramped room with these desks and Thomas Jefferson's cane and all this stuff in Independence Hall that they formulated the Constitution in 1787 in a hot summer where they literally locked the doors and windows so that they could debate in secrecy and speak openly. You can go to the same room. But what were they debating? They were debating something that, that was critical to the day because the country was literally falling apart. Some assumptions that the, that the founders had made when we had an opportunity to set up our first system of government were bad assumptions and they needed a corrective. So we'll look at our constitutional order. Uh, we'll look at two key things that our constitutional order was meant to address. One has to do with the idea of the difference between majority rule and something called majority faction. It is largely the case, I'll argue tonight, and throughout the course that we are seeing the resurgence of what's called majority factions in our system of government. Our, our constitutional order was, was designed to make these less likely, but I think, I think uh, particularly in the, in the course of the last uh, 20 to 30 years, we're seeing a resurgence in these, and these are the kinds of things that you need to be aware of in these categories. Uh, we'll do a basic uh, how the separation of powers was supposed to work. And particularly you'll see this on Saturday where it's, it, you'll see the case that the, sep the separation of powers has largely broken down in regards to the nature of the judiciary and the usurpation of, of power that the judicial branch has, has taken. And this has a huge impact on us. And uh, 
to simply say, I, I, I had a couple students at another university where that uh, uh, seemed to, um, let's just say they seemed to be a little left of center, and uh, I, I thought, well, this would be an interesting conversation, so we went out to coffee after class, and I started to ask, uh, they, they, oh, I know what it was, they started to make a few comments that gave me an indication that they were, um, uh, oh, the girl raised her hand and said, abortion is not a moral issue, it's merely a civil liberties issue. I thought, okay, uh, uh, be interesting to talk to this young lady about it. Well, she, she took her uh, friend with her that was in the class, an African-American young man, and we had a nice conversation and coffee, and we, we, were, we were talking about this. And I said, well, now, let, let's revisit your comment uh, in class here, Elle. What, what, uh, what was the sense of, of um, you know, why is abortion, in your view, not a moral issue, but it's simply a civil liberties issue, that we, whether one ought to be free to do it or constrained from doing it? And um, we had an interesting discussion about that, but the, but the young man chimed in and he said, well, abortion is moral because the law says you can do it. And I said to him, now, interesting, sir. Uh, let's, let's get in a time machine and go back to, I don't know, 1845. <laughs> I think you got any problems. And he caught the gist of the nature that there's got to be something more fundamental to the, to the equation than simply talking about the law. What you'll see is that the Supreme Court, as Kevin has already, already alluded to, uh, uh, points to midair and grounds the nature of things. And if, you, if we take our founding seriously, you'll see that there were, there were men, sorry ladies, but uh, predominantly men were involved in this mix at the time, who thought about things and the nature and the role of religion and grounding things in a very different way. On, th on our dollar bills, you see things called, you, you see this phrase, the novus order seclorum. And that, may, that stands for the new order of the ages. The American framers and founders thought that they were framing a system of government that the rest of the world would look and marvel at and say, if, if this system of government doesn't work, perhaps we need to give up the project to Republican government because this is a new order for the ages. And there's something to be discovered about what they thought. So hence, uh, somewhat of an introduction here to our, to our lecture. Um, the last thing I'd like to cover with you tonight is this idea, and this is the hot button issue. I, I don't feel like I could uh, stand before you in, in October of 2010 and not talk about the difference between a limited versus expansive government. Um, would it be any news to you to say that we live in an age, particularly over the last 18 months, of, of a, a period of history where we're seeing the size and scope of the federal government grow in ways that heretofore we couldn't ha have imagined? Um, it's likely on Tuesday night um, that, that uh, we, will see s we will see a watershed event happen. Um, one of two things is likely to take place. That we will either ratify the direction of the country that we're taking now, or we will reject it and put people in office who we believe are going to change the course of, of a certain direction we're taking. Um, we'll see how it comes out. You know, the polls indicate one thing right now, but you never know until you, until you sort of see how these things come out. And um, uh, the, the president himself has said, that though he is not on the ballot personally, that, that he and his administration are seeing this next election as a referenda on his agenda. And he's been very forthright in his uh, uh, direction that, that he has a vision for the country. And uh, fair enough, uh, the, we live in a democracy where people get opportunities to vote on that. You know, if, you, if you're politically astute, you know that the year 1994 was a, was a fairly notable election. And I believe in 94 that uh, 25, 30, maybe 35 seats changed, house, changed hands in the House of Representatives. There are some estimates that 70 to 80 seats might be up. Maybe even per, uh, some uh, the gross estimates uh, talk about the fact that maybe 100 seats might flip on Tuesday night. So I think 2010 has the potential to be something to talk about. Now, you may be a Democrat or Republican, but th that the point is that this is possibly going to be an historic election. The 1932 election was a historic election, and the, and the Democrats swept Republicans out of office, and that was a historic election, too. So we may look back at 2010 in, in relation to this limited versus expansive government 
and, and, and perhaps, and, and maybe only time will tell here, decades to come, whether the country has, has changed on this nature of limited versus expansive government. And then the question I think that's operative for us to ask is, how does all this relate to religion and politics? I mean, we could just simply approach this like I do uh, for the most part in my survey of American government class and talk about the nature of the American constitutional <coughs> order. But I don't think it would serve us particularly well in this class, in a Christians in the public square class, unless we talked about how these things uh, relate to our topic. How does the, what is the difference between a limited versus expansive government and what, 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 uh, what would that have to do with religion at all? Well, let me give you a hint. There's not a, there's not a single government in, in, in the history of mankind that has gotten larger that has not become more secular. And we are living in a day and age where the expansion of government, and I'll explain to you how this happens, means the expansion of a secular point of view. And it's largely what you'll discover on, on uh, Saturday when we talk about the First Amendment. Okay, um, so let's start, let's start uh, about here. We, we remember that we fought a revolution against the, the, the King of England and we, we issued a Declaration of Independence in July of uh, 1776. And, and if you know anything about the Declaration of Independence, it is essentially a, a putting on notice to, to the world and the, and the powers to be, King George particularly, that he had violated, after a long train of abuses and usurpations, uh, uh, rightful and legitimate leadership uh, or, or authority over the colonist, and they revolted. And so you would think, and you would think correctly, that after the revolution, when the Americans had their first opportunity to establish a government, that they would establish a government that A, possessed very little, if any, executive power, which they did, I always ask my uh, undergrad students, who was the first president of the United States under the first constitutional order? And the correct answer is nobody. But of course, everybody raised their hand and think they're wise, and they say George Washington. Well, Washington doesn't come onto the scene almost 10 years later. Under our first system of government called the Articles of Confederation, we had no executive branch. There was a weak committee in, in the Confederation Congress, and they did a few things, and that led to some problems. But, but all I want to say here to you now is that when we're, when we're looking at the first constitutional order, think about, the, think about what we would have revolted against successfully. Strong central government and particularly monarchical power. And so when we have an opportunity to set up a system of government, we do so very, very weakly. And that that proves to be the Achilles heel of the, uh, of the situation. Now here are the, imagine a day and age where we set up a central government that lacks these kinds of powers. The, under the Articles of Confederation, which was our first constitution, it's a very interesting thing to do to go to the National Archives and everybody goes to see the constitution and they pass right by the Articles of Confederation. <laughs> Most people don't even know what it is. If you read it, it reads like a, uh, a, a wish and a prayer. Of course there'll be cooperation amongst the states. We just fought a revolution together. There was a system of quotas that were voluntary. The, the, nature, the nature of things was very different. So the Articles government, which was largely a legislative government, had no such power to provide for the common defense. This was farmed out to the states. It seemed to go well enough during the, during the revolution, so there you go. We don't, need, we don't need some big powerful army. In fact, uh, that was something that we feared. Not too long ago, we were forced to have redcoats in our homes, if, uh, if you recall that. They lacked the power to regulate interstate commerce, and as interstate means between the states, and as a result of that, uh, it became uh, very quickly upon the early American scene of unbelievable economic chaos because each state had their own currency and when your, your economy and your state went poorly, you just printed more money. And Rhode Island was the grossest example of this. Uh, the federal government, if, if you could even call it a federal government, lacked the power to tax. 
And lastly, it lacked, it, it lacked real independent power. It could not act on its own. Now, if this seems strange to you, think about how the United Nations works today. Right? The United Nations works like the Confederation Congress used to work. You have separate entities, 13 semi-sovereign states under this constitutional order, <coughs> that would send emissaries to the Confederation Congress. And you'll note in the Articles of Confederation, if you were to ever read them, that they never refer to something like the United States. You read the Constitution now and it refers to this, this entity called the United States. In the Articles of Confederation, they referred to it as the United States in Congress assembled. Means that we really didn't even have a federal government until these people got together in one room and then we had the United States in Congress assembled. Sort of like, and it worked very much like the United Nations works in principle. So how does the United Nations work if you're not familiar with this? Each country sends ambassadors and emissaries to the United Nations and they discuss issues of common concern. But there's no coercive force. They get, they get together and they talk about things and then they go have lunch. Or, more likely, they, they each go back to their respective capitals and talk to their heads of state and they talk about what they want to do. So here's the big issue now in the United Nations. What are we going to do about these North Koreans and these Iranians who are, who are pursuing nuclear weapons or threatening us with nuclear weapons? What are we going to do about it? Well, the United Nations get together and they talk about it and they have big powwows about it and then they all go back to their separate capitals and generally nothing happens. And you know who knows hey, it best? Sneaking the out. North Koreans and the Iranians and they play off this. Well, not to go into international politics here, but just to try to give you a picture of the impotency of the federal government. The power during this time resided mostly at the state level, and that, had, that led to some pretty uh, interesting affairs here. The period of time between 1781 and 1787, uh, John Adams labeled the critical period. And it was a critical period because it was, it, 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 it was a period of time in which the very existence of the country hung in the balance. There was a certain assumption of virtue and cooperation amongst the states that was not forthcoming. You had a lot of domestic violence. There was a huge, massive rebellion in the state of Massachusetts. It was called Shays Rebellion. It was a rebellion of, of uh, former military uh, people who were now farmers, former served in the colonial military, that basically threw off the, threw off the government and, and established their own political order, if you wanted to call it, in the state of Massachusetts. And the governor of Massachusetts called, the f called on the cell phone to the federal government and said, could you help us here? And what's interesting to read about the times is the big names of the big names of the time you would know then basically threw their hands up and said, I'm sorry, there was nothing we can do. So these, this w these were the adjectives that described the critical period, a general commercial depression. There was no ability to pay for the national debt because uh, funding the federal treasury was something that was just assumed the states would do, which was not forthcoming. Surprise, surprise. And you have a rising discontent amongst lower socioeconomic classes, particularly d given this day that people were thrown in debtor's prison for not paying their debt. And here's how it would work. You know, I went out fought, fighting with George Washington. I'm a farmer. After the war's over and all the celebration's over, I go back to the family farm, and I've racked up a bunch of, my family's racked up a bunch of debt. I've never been paid for my military service. And to make matters worse, somebody's going to throw me in debtor's jail because of it. Sir. No, no, it means, it means uh, internal. People, uh, people, Americans were turning on Americans. Shays Rebellion being sort of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. The, friends, this was literally a time where the European powers were simply hovering over us, just waiting like a vulture to pick up the scraps. George Washington in his writings openly advocated the idea that we need to maybe consider going over to Europe and getting some two-bit lord and making him our king to reestablish some kind of reasonable political order to the country. That's how bad things were under the Articles of Confederation. 
the second attempt, one, there, was a, there was a call for a conference in Annapolis, Maryland that, that not enough people showed up to that they couldn't do it. In Philadelphia in 1787, they get together and they have a constitutional convention. And you, as I said, you can still go to this room and, and see where they did this. But what they did in Philadelphia was they intentionally sequestered themselves and, and, and came to the conclusion that the Articles of Confederation didn't need to be tweaked, they needed to be manifestly changed. And a very different political order came out of this. And it changed a couple things. One is, it created a new powerful central government. We take for, we take for granted today that the federal government is, is powerful. It certainly wasn't then as powerful as what it was now or what it is now. But the, but the key aspect of the new, new, the new government that it created was that this government that now resides in Washington, D.C. has the ability to act independently of the states. And that couldn't happen before. Within this new powerful central government, we have something that's novel to the history of mankind up to this point called a Republican executive, a president as we now, as we now know him, a, a, an executive who has monarchical type power, but who draws that power from the people and who is accountable to the people and the system of laws that are created within the polity. That's completely novel. People were really glad that George Washington was around and amenable during this time because they weren't quite sure how this would play out. George Mason called Article Two of the Constitution, which is defining the powers of the presidency, the fetus of monarchy and refused to sign the Constitution. Patrick Henry read the Constitution and, and got no further than the preamble and said, I will not sign this. And it's largely for this second reason, because the type of union that, that this new constitution, what we call the constitution, which came to be in 1787, created a very different type of union than what was previously uh, uh, existent under the Articles of Confederation. The reason Patrick Henry read the preamble of the constitution and wouldn't sign it is because th if you know anything about the preamble, it says this, we the people, of the United States. That's all the further he needed to read. Because according to people like Patrick Henry and, and others of his ideological bent, the nature of the union was such where the, where the smallest common political actor should be states, not people. The states are this political subunit that we should deal with. And let me tell you how that works in terms of the nature of the union. There was a group of people who argued against the Constitution. If you, you, may have, you may have heard of these people, they were called the Anti-Federalists. They're the guys in the black hats, if you, if you sort of see this kind of thing. They argued that the nature of the Union should be something like a, what's called the Compact of States Theory. And the Compact of States Theory would be like this. Are you an ordained minister? Yes. I am too. So if some of you are, are, are hit it off with somebody here and maybe would like to get engaged at some point and get married, Kevin and I might be able to marry you someday. And, and you might come to us and sit in our office and say, me and so-and-so, we, we're, we're thinking we're going to get hitched here. Tell us, you guys have been married 20 some odd years. Tell us what marriage is like. Maybe we'd say something like this to you. Well, you know, here's the deal. Uh, Mar you know, we'll have, a, we'll have a wedding ceremony in a month here on, the, on a given Saturday that you've chosen. And, you know, after the ceremony, really nothing fundamental is going to change here. You're your own guy. She's her own girl. You know, you guys can share your finances if you want to. You can cooperate when you want to. It'll sort of be assumed because it seems you kind of like each other. You've had some history. Um, but that's about it. So uh, what's the date? It's likely, and I would hope that you would get up, shake the dust off your feet, and walk out of my office or Kevin's office and say, that's not the project I see biblically. If Kevin and I were to say something like this, well, something really fundamental is gonna happen on this wedding day. The nature of your union is going to be one flesh. That there's something that is going to now fundamentally change about not only your relationship to each other, but your marital bond will be a, one of a, a perpetual nature. 
that, that as the scriptures talk about in Genesis, the two will become one flesh. That, friends, is what the nature of the union they were referring to when they said, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. And you know who reminds us of this 70 years later is Abraham Lincoln. He reminds the Southerners in his first inaugural address that they can't leave like this. It's unlawful. He considers their, their acts of secession to be null and void because they don't understand the nature of the union that was decided in 1787. We've moved away from a compact of states theory and now we have a very different kind of union. And the nature of that union has impact in our topic of religion and politics. There's something about the nature of the union and what it was grounded upon that we need to take cognizance of as we, as we think about this area of religion and politics. Okay. Now, there were a group of people all bent out of shape about the fact that the, we were going to have a new powerful federal government. Now, this, this is by way of segue to, to talking about two key issues here tonight in terms of uh, things that this, that this constitutional order was meant to address. The Federalist argument against the Anti-Federalist who said that the Constitution shouldn't be ratified. Well, they lost. It was ratified. But here was their argument. Their argument was that the manner in which the Constitution designed the, the political order would make it very unlikely that we, would, that we would continue to do things like we were doing during this critical period. And what were those things? We were passing measures legally that were violating people's civil liberties and were causing absolute chaos in society and those were called majority factions. There's, there's a difference between majority rule and what's called majority factions, and I'll explain what a faction is here in a bit, but just to give you a heads up. The second argument that the Federalists argued was that the, because of the separation of powers between the various branches, because of the nature of that separation of powers, this new powerful government, which would in fact be more powerful and really powerful as compared to the weak central government we'd had under the Articles of Confederation, would be safe. If you want to make government safe, you separate its powers. You've all heard the phrase judge, juror, and executioner. You don't want somebody over you like that because they possess judicial, executive, and legislative power over you. If I want to make you safe and you have that kind of authority over me, I separate your powers. And the federal government is not only separated horizontally, but, but governmental powers also, uh, I should say, it's separated horizontally and vertically. And it's that vertical, I'm sorry, it's the horizontal power that we have largely forgotten about with the issue of federalism, which we will mention in great detail here as we go forward. Okay, so let's talk about this first issue. How is this constitution designed to deal with this first problem of majority faction? What's a faction? If you're interested in reading about this in detail, there's a book, which I happen to have, called The Federalist Papers. Anybody ever read The Federalist Papers? These are a series of 85 newspaper editorials. My students just cringe when I think about reading the Federalist Papers, and I tell them, get over it. These are, these are things that Americans read over their morning coffee in 1787 and 1788. You can deal with this. Well, Federalist 9 and 10 is, is one that you might want to visit if you're interested in this topic. And this is almost word for word out of Federalist 10 of what a faction is. It's when you get a group of people who have a common impulse or passion. Fair enough, people do that. But the part that, thing, that the part that makes a faction bad is that, that these interests or, or these passions coalesce around things that are adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the common good. And let me give you an example of how this played out during the critical period. As I mentioned, the state of Rhode Island was the most egregious in its example of passing factious majority pieces of legislation that work like this. The state of Rhode Island's economy was in the tank, like, like many other 
uh, states during this time period, during this critical period. And so in order to solve their economic problems, the people, the good people of the state of Rhode Island started electing people who said the following during their political campaigns. If you elect me to the state house in Rhode Island, I will vote for paper money, meaning that when I get there, I'll vote yes at the right time so that the state of Rhode Island and the government simply prints more paper money and we'll just get more money in your hands and that'll solve our economic problems. Well, all for, for all you economists out there, you know what that's going to do. It's going to create hyperinflation, which it did. And, and now here's how that, and, and it passed legally. Nobody had guns out. Nobody, nobody did anything. More hands went up and said yes than said no. So it was a majority, but it was a factious majority. And here's how it played out. So, so I'll pick on Jonathan because I know Jonathan. So let's say I'm in Rhode Island and I, and I borrow money from Jonathan before this paper money law is passed. And Jonathan loans me something of value, either gold or some kind of money that's tied to a gold standard. Now it comes time to pay him back, but I'm paying him back after the paper money law is passed. And I come to Jonathan with this monopoly money and I say, here you go, big boy. What do you think Jonathan's going to tell me? Uh, take that money and uh, don't let the door hit you on the way out, right? Yeah? Well, that's what started to happen is that creditors started refusing this worthless money. Now, here's where the factious part kicks in. A stipulation of the law was that if Jonathan refused to take this worthless money, he goes to jail. <laughs> so we have now passed a law based upon a majority that gets a majority vote that ends up violating a guy's civil liberties. And it's certainly not to the public good. It caused, it caused you know, hyperinflation. But here's a guy's civil liberties who's being an honest businessman and he finds himself in jail because he won't take my worthless money. And this is kind of the nature of a, a factious majority. Factions could either be peaceable like that or factions could be like they were in Massachusetts where people picked up guns and they said no more. And they had more people with them than against them. And so the state of Massachusetts was in utter chaos for, for a nine month period of time where it was just absolute anarchy. There was no rule of law and things just ran out. And that's precisely what Federalist 9 and 10 predicted would happen in terms of factions. And what was that faction over? Oh, uh, people were being thrown in debtor's prison because they couldn't pay their debt in Massachusetts or the one in Rhode Island. Well, it, it involved both a financial issue. One, one turned bloody, one was not so bloody, but they were both factious type majorities. So the new system of government was designed in such a way as to make it less likely that such factious majorities would happen. Now, here's my, here's my tie to, the common, to, the, to, the, to, to our era right now. It is arguably the case that we're starting to see the resurgence of factious majority type things. When people in a democracy <clears throat> find out and discover that they can vote for things or put people in office that appear very good but end up being harmful to the public good, we're starting to see the resurgence of factious majorities forming in the country with no consideration given to whether it might be something for the common good. What friends might inform the common good. Legal positivism won't do it. Metaphysical or philosophical naturalism will not do it. It is arguably going to have to be grounded in something more fundamental that I would argue that you, dear friends, can bring to the table much more than some Harvard professor arguing for some categorical imperative or something crazy like that. So this, all this ties to the notion of a common good. Once we lose the sense of what it means to have a common good and have a foundation of this, we start to go in this direction. So no, simply by the fact that we form a majority, and this is really the common criticism of Marxist and communist about the, about the nature of democracies. And by the way, the ancient political philosophers were all over this as well is the idea that, that there's, there is an assumed wisdom in a majority. Well, not necessarily. Just because we can get more people to vote for something does not entail that there's wisdom behind this. And, and, and just a category that I want you all to, cert, to start to be aware of 
in this regard is you start to engage people in the public square. It is not a defeater simply to say that, that it is right simply because we had a majority of people vote on it. There's a more fundamental debate that we might want to consider. Okay, separation of powers. And I, I won't go into the full-blown explanation of this, but essentially the Constitution establishes a situation, ironically enough, that invites conflict. It invites conflict. Why, anybody have any insight as to why the Constitution actually invites conflict between the executive and legislative and judicial departments? How would it do this? We see it around us all the time, particularly between the executive and legislative branch. We're seeing it more and more to some extent with the judicial department. Any clue, sir? <clears throat> that's, that's usually, uh, that's more of his argument from Federalist 10 in the back half of 51, Federalist 51, about how the issue of majority faction would be dealt with. The argument there, just to, to briefly rehearse that, I didn't want to give you the full-blown version of it, Madison's famous argument for an extended republic is that when you bring more people to the table, you multiply the number of interests and you make it less likely that a majority would coalesce around some kind of factiousness or something contrary to the common good. Here's the example real quick that I give to my students. Early on in class I say, well listen, we're, we're kind of new here and, and you don't know me real well, but uh, I always pass a law in, the, in this uh, class very early on if we could pass such a measure that the redheads here will do all the work for us. Anybody up for that? Well, you know, pretty soon a few selfish hands start to go up and people go, yeah, I'll vote for that. Well, the redheads start to feel the weight of a factious majority starting to coalesce around them and their civil liberties are going to be violated. And by the way, it's also contrary to the common good because nobody in class is going to learn anything if that's the case, right? So if we took such a vote in here, you know, I mean, I don't know, there's somewhat of a red tint to that gentleman's hair, so maybe he's going to be doing it, right? I mean, closest I can get, it's certainly not mine. <clears throat> so, so that's, that's sort of how a, a factious majority would easily form, and it forms very easily. Yeah, sure, I don't want to do work. It forms around laziness, right? Well, what happens if we would invite more people into the room and retook the vote? More redheads would show up, more people who would know redheads, more people who would recognize this is just crazy stuff, and it'd make it less likely that a, that a majority would coalesce around. And that's Madison's argument that he was referring to. Okay. So separation of powers. Uh, the reason that the Constitution invites conflict, and if you, a close reading of the Constitution will show you this, is that, they, that there's actually an intermingling of powers. Federalist 47 through 51 makes this, this full-blown argument, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the cliff notes. That, that the Constitution invites conflict because the president has a little legislative power, and not a little, he's got the power of the veto, that's not small. And the, and the legislative branch has a bit of executive business. They have to, they, they can approve, uh, 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 they have to approve in the Senate uh, his, his choice for cabinet and, and this kind of thing. They have a piece of the war power. Uh, they have to ratify treaties. Those are usually seen as the three biggest ones. And the judicial branch, it has a bit of, the, it has a bit of uh, legislative power where it can declare null and void an act of the legislature. And boy, aren't they good at doing that particularly here at the, at the state level here in California, uh, as, we're, as we're seeing here with, with Proposition 8. So the Constitution actually invites conflict. And, and the way that the system of separation of powers works, and I think I have a slide on this. <coughs> Did I advance it twice? This is the famous line from Federalist 51 that gives you a sense of how the separation of powers was supposed to work. And the reason I'm sharing this with you now is not so that you become constitutional scholars, but so that you'll have something to compare to this to Friday, Saturday, sorry, where you'll start to see that the system of separation of powers is breaking down with the judiciary because the executive branch and the legislative branch is acquiescing to the courts taking upon themselves legislative policymaking power and they're acquiescing. They're, they're, they're not doing what Federalist 51, Madison argued they would do. 
So federal is 51, but the great security against the gradual concentration of several powers, which is tyranny, in the same department consists in giving to those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and the personal motives to resist the encroachments of the other branches. The way it was supposed to work was self-policing. That when one branch perceived a potential encroachment on their turf, that the other, that that branch would have the constitutional means and the motives to resist it. And so he continues, the provision for the defense must in this, as in all other cases, be made commensurate to the danger of attack. And here's a very famous line from the Federalist, ambition must be made to counter ambition. The founders took a very realistic view of human nature. What follows this in Federalist 51 is one of the most famous uh, lines of prose in all the Federalists and all of uh, U.S. political history. If men were angels, we wouldn't need this. If men were ruled by angels, we wouldn't need this. But they're not angels. We need this, right? And this has largely worked over, over 200 some odd years of history. And, and it's likely that it's breaking down. How does that have impact to Christians in the public square and the question of religion? What the court has largely done with this question of religion has been done over the head of a Congress who at least talks about the fact the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, 1993, Three. Congress passes a piece of legislation that, that says, boy, we look at this court case that you just did here a year or so ago, and we think it's terrible, and we think we need to restore a balance of religion in the public order, and the court says, oh yeah, that's con unconstitutional, and it's get thrown out. And the legislature largely puts its tail between its legs and goes running off into the corner. So it has the constitutional means, but it is lacking the personal motives to resist these encroachments. Why do you think that? Oh, very easily, because our congressmen and senators want to get reelected and they don't want to make hard decisions on issues. So they grouse and they go, oh, that crazy uh, court, that activist court, blah, blah, blah. And then when the camera goes off, they go, Whew, I'm glad I didn't have to vote on abortion. Now here's how the separation of powers was meant to work and it did work. Back in the early 2000s, um, the, the, the war in, in Afghan, uh, Iraq was becoming increasingly unpopular and when the Democrats took over the House and the, and the Senate, they started to make uh, what's called appropriation bills for the military, which run on two-year cycles, more difficult for President Bush to get them and they started to attach uh, stipulations, for lack of a better word. So they said, George, you can have your money for another two years of war over there in Iraq, but um, we're going to put a timeline on, if you sign this on this bill, you're committing to having the troops out by date certain. Now, why would that be an encroachment on executive power? Because it is the executive is the commander in chief that tells the troops when they come and go, not the legislative branch. The executive department uh, perceived the possible encroachment on the power and threatened to veto that. So they had the constitutional means and the personal motives to resist it and did so. Congress caved and gave President Bush the money and, and you go on. What you'll see Saturday is that, is that that system of separation of powers regarding judicial power is breaking down. And that has some huge impact for us regarding the uh, religious question. Okay, now the, the second big issue that's oftentimes overlooked regarding the separation of powers. When we think about separation of powers, we oftentimes just think about it in terms of divi a division of power between executive, legislative, and judicial. That's sort of a vertical separation. What we have largely forgotten in this country is that there is a separation of powers between the federal government and the state government largely through advances and interpretations of the 14th Amendment, we've come to the conclusion in this country that the federal government can essentially do whatever it wants to do, and the court has largely acquiesced in this regard, uh, starting in the 1930s, um, to advancement in, in federal power under, under either some construal of the 14th Amendment or as some understanding of the Commerce Clause which is precisely what the, what the federal Congress now is appealing to on this health care issue. 
if you've paid attention, there's how many states now are uh, suing the federal government that the, that the health care law, Obamacare, is, is unconstitutional for, for various and sundry provisions. And the argument on behalf of the administration and the government is, no, 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 this is, this is simply an exertion of commerce clause power, which is, is in Article I of the Constitution. Well, what we've largely forgotten here is that, is that, the, that the states were meant to be uh, uh, sovereign entities, not completely sovereign like they were under a com compact of state theory, but a residual of power was meant to reside in the states as a protective against a big, powerful federal government. If the anti-federalists could come back at us today, friends, they'd be wagging their little finger going, I told you so. This, th th they would say things to us like, this government had the potential, they would argue, back in 1789 to become what it's become today. Can you think of an area of our lives that the federal government is not involved in? Now, I ask my students this, and I'll ask you this. What president said the following? Veterans affairs? Taking care of veterans? This is not something the federal government does. I ask you this to give you a sense of, if Barack Obama said that, do you think there would be some uh, uh, controversy today? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, because it's largely decided that, that, that it's the purview of the federal government to provide for veterans. And, and perhaps that's, that's appropriate. But what president do you think, when it when addressed the issue of dealing with veterans, said, I'm sorry, that's the business of charity. That's not the business of the federal government. No. Who? Lincoln. A little bit after. Well, Lincoln didn't stay around long enough to deal with the veterans very long. If you remember, uh, John Wilkes Booth took care of that. Uh, U.S. Grant. And now why would that be stinking ironic? Here's the guy who led these men. And, and, and if you know the la latter part of the Civil War, it was a battle of attrition, which the Southerners uh, uh, eventually lost. But uh, how odd that, and how far have we come to do this. Now I'll introduce you at some point to the progressives and you still see this buzz term thrown out. The pro oh, I'm really progressive. What does that mean? Oh, California, it's a progressive state. What does that mean? Wh how would progressive, progressivism relate to our question in this class of religion in the public square? You ought to know what a progressive is and, you and, and, and we'll try to make you aware of that. Okay. Now, the last of our topics here tonight as we go forward is, is this issue of limited versus expansive government. So we'll talk more about this tomorrow night, but let me just say a few quick words on this. The election that, we're, that we are uh, having Tuesday um, could, could be a defining moment. It, it could turn the tide if, you're, if, you, if you feel uh, happy or sad about that. Uh, I'll leave that up to you, but, but it, it very well may turn the tide in terms of a direction that we're taking in, in terms of the federal government here. Uh, the federal government is growing, and isn't it, uh, oh, I already put it up there, Jefferson. This is an interesting quote uh, that Jefferson, uh, when Jefferson took over from Washington and Adams, the Jeffersonians had a very different perspective on the nature of federal power and we're very distrustful of it. And so you'll see a lot of quotes about Jefferson regarding uh, the nature of federal power. The Jeffersonians thought not only was the federal government becoming too powerful, but the president was becoming too monarchical. And if you know anything about Jefferson, he would do odd kinds of things. So when visiting heads of state would come, he would show up in what would be the equivalent of today in blue jeans and a flannel at state dinners to make a statement that the President of the United States is not a monarch. He had some reason uh, to uh, react in such a way. John Adams, uh, when the Constitution was being debated, uh, thought that a proper title for the President of the United States should be His Royal Highness, His Most Highest Majesty, the President of the United States. And Washington said, thank you, President will suffice. So Jefferson and his crowd had a, had a reason uh, to believe this. So the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield while government gains ground. And we have to ask ourselves whether liberty 
And in fact, this is the gist of the suits that are being raised against the federal government. Now, is that, that there would be a tax, a fee, a penalty, or whatever they're gonna call this, that if you do not register or get health care of some degree, that there's going to be some kind of uh, penalty in, in this regard. Uh, is that an impingement on our liberty? Well, it's certainly a growth of the, of the scope of the federal government. There are certain provisions that are arguing, people arguing, states, attorney generals are arguing that this is an improper impingement on our civil liberties, that we have, we, we have the right not to engage in this kind of commerce. If I want to not have health care, I have this right. Um, we'll see. Uh, a judge in Michigan has said, nope, you don't have that right. Uh, a judge in Florida said, I think you might have that right. So we'll, they're out there court shopping right now, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so it's an open question. Stay, open, uh, stay, stay tuned to next Tuesday about whether the American people will make a statement in this regard. I had the good fortune of uh, being in Phoenix uh, last, at the end of last week and, and weekend. And uh, as I was driving from one appointment to another, I, I, I heard on the radio that a Tea Party rally was taking place in downtown Phoenix around the state capitol there. And uh, Sarah Palin was making a surprise visit. And so I thought, I've got to see this. And because I had heard all kinds of things about tea parties and I wanted to see, are these people really racist? Are they really hateful? That kind of thing, because you'd sort of see this in the national media. So I went down. And I'll show you some pictures later, uh, later in the week when we have more, or, uh, when we have more time. But uh, it was a very respectful, uh, it was standard boilerplate stuff that what you would think you'd find at a tea party. Cries for more limited government, a lot of don't tread on me flags, um, generally white, non-Hispanic, uh, largely male, uh, uh, a lot of retired, a lot of military type, type folks that were at this. It was a fairly impromptu visit, but uh, I walked up right as Governor Palin was starting to speak, of which she spoke a whole three minutes. And you'll see pictures of it here. Uh, I'll show you later this week. She had Trig on her hip, the little boy with Down syndrome. She had him on her hip. And, he, and uh, even when she was out circulating amongst the crowd, she kept the, kept the boy on her hip, which I thought was uh, sort of an interesting dynamic there, that a, a potential president of the United States had a little boy on her hip. You know, it was a pretty interesting type, type affair. But uh, in large part, the Tea Party has burgeoned. And, and whether you're a fan of the party or not, um, largely the Tea Party movement has been a grassroots political movement questioning the growth and size and scope of the federal government. There have been uh, several Tea Party candidates that have defeated established Republican candidates in various states. Uh, for governor's races, for uh, Senate races predominantly, and we're going to see how they do. Uh, if Sharon Angle can defeat, uh, what's his name, uh, Reed in Nevada, uh, that would be huge. That would just be huge. It doesn't, it's not likely that O'Donnell, another political uh, novice uh, in uh, Delaware, will defeat a somewhat self-professed Marxist in, the, in Delaware, but it's Delaware. Um, and the other one is Brand Paul, who looks almost a lock to, uh, to be getting the uh, Senate race locked up there in, uh, in uh, Kentucky. So let's talk about the, f the size and scope of the federal government. Uh, these are numbers that you ought to just have handy. A really interesting thing to do is Google the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, National Debt Calculator. Your eye will not be able to follow how fast it's increasing. These are the numbers. These are how fast the federal government is growing. And there's, there's, there's a bit of a story on both sides, isn't there? When you look at the, at the upon Barack Obama's inauguration, the federal debt was 10 trillion, six, 600 million, billion, sorry, uh, dollars. Uh, and it has grown by th over 3 billion, 3 trillion, sorry, these numbers are so big it's hard to keep track of them. It has grown by that, and the Republicans are beating the Democrats up over this fact. Why? Because we've injected $3 trillion into the economy, uh, largely via debt, and we don't have much to show for it. We were told that the stimulus pr program had to be passed or unemployment would, go, it would be safely kept at 8% and it would go down from there. Well, 
that hasn't proved to be the case. So the Republicans are beating up the Democrats and, and largely successfully in, in this regard. But here's an operative number that we ought to pay attention to as well. The political party who talks about limited government and shrinking the size and scope of the federal government saw the debt go almost up $5 trillion during its term of service. And this largely left John McCain holding the bag in 2008 because there were a lot of fiscal conservatives that simply couldn't get behind John McCain because they thought it would be another continuation of George Bush. Um, along with your handout, typos, oh gosh, do I have typos? Oh my gosh, well, uh, I, I beg your pity and your pardon given that uh, I'm teaching five classes this semester, well, but, but point well taken. 2009. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so I will, I will change that one. 2009 would be the correct date. Thank you, sir. So yes, so uh, the, the size and scope of the federal government is increased. If you want to see a graph, uh, I think I may have another Jefferson quote here first. Isn't it interesting how people who could say things 200 some odd years from now have such pertinence in, in today's time. I place economy amongst the first and most important Republican virtues, and public debt is the greatest danger to be feared. To preserve our independence, we must, we must not, thank you, there's another typo, let our rulers load us with personal debt. Now, as a side note, uh, whether you're an Alexander Hamilton fan or not, uh, we owe a lot to Alexander Hamilton, who set this country on a firm financial footing, uh, who was a arch enemy, political enemy of Thomas Jefferson. So it's interesting that Jefferson um, would say this. And it, it is uh, a political fact of history that Hamilton supported Jefferson for the presidency when push came to shove in a locked house when the election went to the house. And that largely ca uh, cost Alexander Hamilton his life. If you remember, he died in a duel with Aaron Burr. Okay, so one last look here at the at the question. There, there are two issues here that I think are going to be fundamental to this election that we need to consider. One is, is the growth of the government on this current trajectory sustainable? What should we think about this biblically? Is it moral? Is it virtuous? Is it, is it Christian-like? to be voting for measures that are largely strapping people who are yet to be with debt. Are we passing the, I think these are legitimate questions to ask. And the one issue we need to ask ourselves is, is this trajectory sustainable? This is, the, uh, apart from the religious question, this is becoming an issue of national security. Uh, you might be aware that there are some countries that fund our national debt uh, that oftentimes don't have our best national interest in mind. And if they ever called in that debt, uh, we might be in a heap of trouble. So this is a national security issue, uh, not, uh, notwithstanding the moral issue that it is. Uh, if you look at these debt calculators, you see the debt going up for every person in the United States is responsible for some crazy ten, twelve thousand dollar figure, and the number just keeps going up and up and up. It's just not sustainable. And I think in large part, you're seeing even, uh, you don't see anybody on either side of the political spectrum out there arguing that it needs to be sustained. What will be important to, to watch for is regardless of who takes power January of 2011, uh, are they really going to do something about this? That'll be the really interesting question. Now, last thing I want to uh, enliven you to, and, and a bit of a change of subject here, is, is the nature of what our government was supposed to be. That is the other issue that I think is preeminent in this election. The first issue is, is the growth and s the size and scope of the federal government, is it sustainable? And it's likely it's not that some, some, some real significant change is going to have to take place. The other issue that I think is up for debate and what the Tea Party and others are starting to surface is that we're starting to ask ourselves about the nature of what our government was supposed to be. Um, there, I think we have finally reached a critical mass. The finances have driven this, 
but we finally reached a critical mass where we're starting to ask ourselves, what is the nature of what this government was designed to be and what has it become? Now this rather strange looking thing with the state of nature and the social contract and civil society may not be familiar to you, so I'll, I'll explain that. But this gets back to the question of what the nature of the government was set up to be. Was it set up to be limited or to be this ever expansive system of government? It is arguably the case that it was set up in a much more limited sense and we have moved away from that. Whether we can go back to a day and age where it would be uncontroversial for a president to say, veterans affairs? What does the federal government have to do about that? That's not likely. Can we, ta can we tailor down and, and pull back the scope of the federal government? Uh, well, stay tuned. Tuesday might be the first real step toward that if the country speaks in this regard. And it will be very interesting to see how the administration responds. If people like Barbara Boxer go down and Patty Murray and Harry Reid go down, the, the administration will have to notice this. So we, we could talk political strategy all day long. What is the state of the, the The American system of government was set up under a modernist conception of government. And this is, this, uh, there were three big political thinkers, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, that were known as social contract theorists. And here's how the system worked. These three thinkers, of whom the founders were intimately relate, uh, aware of, particularly Locke, would be aware, these three thinkers were aware or postulated the idea that, that men existed at some point in human history in a state of nature as isolated beings, living as isolated individuals, not as part of civil society. And because of certain dangers or inconveniences, to state it lightly, Hobbes actually thought that the state of nature devolved into a state of war in which we lived, we lived in a continual fear of violent death. <laughs> so much for inconveniences, yeah? Um, that, that these modern political philosophers and, and largely our political order was founded under this rubric that because of the inconveniences of the state of nature, men needed to be coerced into civil society. And the way that they were coerced or agreed to come into civil society was through a social contract. And the social contract did two things. It's not the people lined up at a table and signed on the dotted line. It was a tacit agreement that one, when one committed to being a part of a civil society, that, that a couple things happened. One is it bound you as a people so that when you entered civil society, there was an eternal bond as a people that you would have. So even after the revolution, the, the, the Americans still saw brotherhood or sisterhood, whatever the term would be, with the British people because the bond that was established under the British system of government bound those people. George Washington would have considered him in some sense a British man even after the revolution in this regard. But now here's the other part of what a social contract does that's pertinent to our purposes. It establishes a political bond or a political system of government that is not eternal, that can be broken. So when you read the Declaration of Independence and it says something to the effect of when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for what? One people to do what? dissolve the political bands which previously bound them. And so the Declaration of Independence is an announcement that the political bands, the legitimacy of the bonds that we had under the British system have now been broken. And you can read Locke's uh, second treatise on government. And you'll see that Jefferson had that open to him when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. And the argument is the king's blown it and he's blown it a bunch of times and we're announcing it to the world and it's over. Now here's the point. The point is that when you establish a social contract for a government to do something, you set it up under a certain conception. And it's largely, uh, while we don't have time to f sort of fully unpack this, that the social contract that we had under the American system of government established a very limited form of government. Yes, and, and this is why I told you about the Articles government versus this government that we have now. Yes, it was more powerful. Yes, it had real independent power, but it did not employ the government to, to arguably do what it's doing today. Some people think that, the, that we, are, we are fast heading to a situation of totalitarianism. 
and, and here is another touch point that you'll want to just sort of have as a category. Throughout history, there's a great article by, by Fareed Zakari, if you're interested in reading it, and he argues, and I think he's right about this, that one of the functions of the church, and I'm speaking sort of uh, broadly here, not just, the, not just the church, like the Presbyterian church, but, the, but religion in general in this sense, is meant to serve as a check on the pretensions of the state. And during, in, in the American founding, religion was, was absolutely seen as something that would provide a check. How would it provide a check on the, because our rights were grounded in something beyond what the state said your rights. If the state can give you rights, it can take them away. The founding generation understood clearly that our, that our rights, that, that they, they were grounded in something extra governmental that religion as a whole served as a limit on the state. So in that sense, because religion is a separate thing to the state, so separation of church and state in itself is not bad in terms of separate entities. We'll talk more about what that's come to mean today. It's largely come to mean wherever government is, religion needs to flee. And you, you'll see how that, the evolution of that Saturday. But religion was meant to serve as a check on the state. And what I think we see happening today with the growth of the size and scope of the federal government, it goes hand in hand with the idea that religion has been beating a hasty retreat. Sometimes we're blowing the trumpet as we, as we retreat some measure happily. Uh, we're here today to, to, as Kevin said, in a very real sense, we need to go on the offense. And part of being on the offense is understanding the nature of the battle. And what I've tried to do over here the past hour is to give you a sense of that. What is the sense of the American system of government? Um, how is it set up? What's it supposed to be? So that now we sort of have a framework for conversation and, and as we go forward here, so. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.